Greetings, and welcome to the Construction Partner Partners First Quarter 2024 Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Rick Black of Investor Relations. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Thank you, operator, and good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us for the Construction Partners call to review first quarter results for fiscal 2024. This call is also being webcast and can be accessed through the audio link on the events and presentations page of the Investor Relations section of constructionpartners.net. Information recorded on this call speaks only as of today, February 9, 2024. Please be advised that any time-sensitive information may no longer be accurate as of the date of any replay listening or transcript reading. I would also like to remind you that the statements made in today's discussion that are not historical facts, including statements of expectations or future events or future financial performance, are considered forward-looking statements made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. We will be making forward-looking statements as part of today's call that by their nature are uncertain and outside of the company's control. Actual results may differ materially. Please refer to our earnings press release for our disclosure on forward-looking statements. These factors and other risks and uncertainties are described in detail in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Management will also refer to non-GAAP measures, including adjusted EBITDA. Reconciliations to the nearest GAAP measures can be found at the end of our earnings press release. Construction Partners assumes no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statements. And now I would like to turn the call over to Construction Partners CEO, Jewel Smith. Jewel? Thank you, Rick, and good morning, everyone. Joining me on the call today are Greg Hoffman, our Chief Financial Officer, and Ned Fleming, our Executive Chairman. We are off to a good start to our fiscal year, and I'd first like to thank our 4,400 employees throughout the Southeast for their hard work and professionalism that contributed to a successful first quarter. Revenue, net income, earnings per share, and adjusted EBITDA were all up significantly compared to Q1 last year. We are pleased to report a record backlog of $1.62 billion as of quarter end, reflecting a demand environment that remains strong for both public and private work. This first quarter, we experienced typical seasonal weather, with October and November a bit drier than usual, while December was a bit wetter than usual. Our crews and teams were productive and delivered excellent results this quarter. Focusing more on the demand environment for construction services, there continues to be elevated demand for road repair, maintenance, and expansion projects across our markets as a result of our country's continued migration south. Each of our six states are well-funded for this work, with the federal government's IIJA funding further supporting infrastructure investments, from road projects to airports to ports and rail lines. Because of the migration to the Sun Belt of both new residents and businesses, the commercial economic activity in our markets has remained steady with an active bidding environment. We anticipate that our work mix for FY24 will remain very similar to last year and typical for CPI, with approximately 63% public projects and 37% private projects. Turning now to CPI's strategic growth model. In this fiscal year, we've so far completed four strategic acquisitions, entering new markets, expanding market share in existing markets, and adding capacity, services, and talented new team members to the CPI family. Most recently, we announced on January 3rd the acquisitions of SJNL General Contractor, a hot mix asphalt and site work company headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, and Littlefield Construction Company, a soil-based surface treatment and site work company headquartered 
in Waycross, Georgia. As we discussed in detail during our analyst day, a key component of our growth strategy is to actively expand our relative market share and service capabilities within existing markets. Both the SJNL and Littlefield acquisitions expand our service offerings in existing markets while also adding valuable crews and equipment. In the case of SJNL in Huntsville, Alabama, we are integrating this team with our existing platform company in the state, Wiregrass Construction Company. The Greater Huntsville Metro Area and Interstate 65 Corridor continue to experience tremendous growth, and as a combined organization, we can now offer turnkey services spanning the construction value chain on both private and public project opportunities within this market. Likewise, our Georgia platform company, the Scruggs Company, entered the Waycross market just a few months ago through the establishment of a Greenfield hot mix asphalt plant. Now having acquired Littlefield, we are even better positioned to capitalize on the market that reaches from the Port of Brunswick into South Central Georgia. We are pleased to expand our presence in these crucial growth markets and proud to welcome the employees of SJNL and Littlefield into our continually growing CPI family. We continue to have numerous and active conversations with potential sellers both inside and outside of our current states. The universe of potential opportunities in our highly fragmented industry is substantial. However, we remain patient and focused on finding the best strategic acquisitions that expand our footprint, increase capacity, grow relative market share, and fit well within our CPI culture. We believe CPI is seen as the buyer of choice for many owners in the Southeast due to our reputation for treating sellers fairly, providing attractive career opportunities for their employees, and our track record for successfully integrating and growing companies. As we continually discuss with the market, CPI's founding strategy has three main components. First, to operate a high relative market share business in local markets, building low risk, high margin projects for repeat customers and generating strong free cash flow. Second, to capitalize on the need for the nation and our states to invest in catching up on deferred infrastructure maintenance and capacity. And third, as our industry goes through a generational consolidation to be the leader in building a scalable business by acquiring businesses in our industry. Our five-year strategic plan that we call Roadmap 2027 simply outlines our plan to continue implementing CPI strategy with growth targets that represent annual revenue growth of 15 to 20% and EBITDA margins in the range of 13 to 14 percent by 2027. The foundation of our strategic plan remains our people. We plan to continue building a competitive advantage through our workforce, maintaining our organizational culture as a family of companies, and providing superior benefits and career opportunities which attract and retain the best construction professionals. At CPI, we are dedicated to building better lives and to building the infrastructure that keeps our communities connected. In summary, we are pleased after Q1 to be right on track with our plan as we enter the second quarter of our seasonal business, where we are hard at work maintaining our fleet and asphalt plants and preparing for the busy work season ahead in the spring and the summer. I'd now like to turn the call over to Greg. Thank you, Jewel, and good morning, everyone. I'll begin with a review of our key performance metrics for the first fiscal quarter compared to the fiscal first quarter in 2023. Revenue was $396.5 million, up 16%. The increase included $29.6 million of revenue attributable to acquisitions 
completed during and subsequent to the three months into December 31st, 2022, and an increase of approximately $25.1 million of revenue in the company's existing markets from contract work and sales of HMA and aggregates to third parties. The mix of total revenue growth for the quarter was approximately 7.3% organic revenue and approximately 8.7% from recent acquisitions. Gross profit was $51.9 million, or 13.1% of revenue compared to $30.5 million, or 8.9% of revenue in Q1 2023. General and administrative expenses were $36 million, and as a percentage of revenue, were 9.1% compared to 8.7% in the same period last year. Net income was $9.8 million, and diluted earnings per share were $0.19, cents, up from $1.9 million and diluted earnings per share of $0.04 cents in the same quarter last year. Adjusted EBITDA was $40.9 million, an increase of 50.4%. Adjusted EBITDA margin for the quarter was 10.3% compared to 8% in the first quarter last year. You can find gap to non-gap reconciliations of net income and adjusted EBITDA financial measures in today's earnings release. In addition, as Jewel mentioned, we are reporting a record project backlog of $1.62 billion at December 31st, 2023, up from $1.6 billion at the end of our Q4 fiscal year 2023. Turning now to the balance sheet, we had $68.7 million of cash and cash equivalents and $154 million available under the credit facility, net of a reduction for outstanding letters of credit. In addition, we have the ability to establish an incremental revolving credit facility up to the greater of $200 million or total trailing 12 months adjusted EBITDA. We have $280 million of principal outstanding under the term loan and $163 million outstanding under the revolving credit facility. The availability on our credit facility and cash generation will continue to provide flexibility and capacity to allow for potential near-term acquisitions and high-value growth opportunities. As of the end of the quarter, our debt to trailing 12 months EBITDA ratio was 1.78 times. Our expectation is the leverage ratio will maintain a range of 1.5 to 2.5 times while continuing to add sustained profitable growth. Cash provided by operating activities was $60.4 million, compared to the $28.9 million in the same quarter last year. Net capital expenditures in the first quarter were $24.3 million. We expect net capital expenditures for fiscal 2024 to be in the range of $90 to $95 million. This includes maintenance capex of approximately 3.25% of revenue, with the remaining amount invested in high return growth initiatives. Today, we are maintaining our previously disclosed fiscal year 2024 outlook. We expect revenue in the range of $1.75 to $1.825 billion, net income in the range of $63 to $70 million, and adjusted EBITDA in the range of $197 to $219 million, which reflects adjusted EBITDA margin in the range of 11.3% to 12%. And with that, we are now ready to take your questions. Operator? Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Katherine Thompson with Thompson Research Group. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Thank you for taking my questions today. Um, I just wanted to focus on two... uh, Morning. I wanted to focus on two uh, end markets. Um, and first, with the DOT work this quarter was 37% versus 33%. Um, 
in Q1 for the last two years, but the public contribution overall in Q1 was slightly lower than the previous quarters at 59% versus 61. So it just seems that public non-DOT work was a lower contributor to this quarter. Is there is there anything to call out on the municipal level that could be driving this, or, or any other color just to account for the delta? No, Catherine, I I, uh, I don't think so. Um, we bid a lot of public work uh, that's city, counties, and DOTs, and um, you know, so the mix of what we're doing on public work in any one quarter can vary, but. Um, there's nothing particular that's changed about that. Uh, we do anticipate this year, as we said in the prepared remarks, that uh, our mix of work will be about 63% public and 37% private. Um, you know, in the public work, you know, cities, counties, uh, DOT, and airports, different, they'll all play a you know, part in that public mix. Okay. Perfect. And then on the, the private side, um, you know, all our channel checks still point to manufacturing, heavy industrial still strong, um, and some, some edges of weakness uh, continuing in for traditional office and shopping centers. Can you touch more on current trends you're seeing uh, on the private side and how the type of work for heavy versus light is um, differing from uh, any trends you're seeing in highway work. Yeah, I think you're exactly right with what you said, Catherine. What we're seeing is that as businesses continue to migrate to the southeast, as they reshore, uh, we're seeing a lot of manufacturing facilities get built, uh, headquarters buildings, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing sites, that's a, a lot more of what we're bidding on. We do continue to see residential stay very steady, um, but there's not as many office buildings and retail buildings in the mix, but there's a lot more of the, as you would say, the heavy commercial sites. Okay, and then final question, just as more on, uh, we've, we've seen some abatement of, of raw materials, uh, but there are other costs that are going up. What are you seeing from DOTs or, and other contractors in terms of bidding expectations around input cost? And are there any other type of costs like insurance that are um, preventing projects from moving forward? Uh, I would say, Catherine, the clearly inflation, uh, our DOTs have had to adjust their estimates to match the, the reality of input costs that um, are out there in the marketplace. And I think they, they're doing that. We're seeing their estimates go up to where projects aren't getting held up. Uh, it has um, affected their purchasing power to some extent, but there's still a lot of things being bid, and I don't see projects getting held up uh, by that. I think they're adjusting to the, to the new world uh, of input costs. I think that inflation is continues to... Um, be steady. It's not. It's not out of hand like it was a couple years ago. But I think the DOTs, by and large, are keeping up with that in their uh, outlooks and their estimates. Okay, great. Thanks so much for uh, answering my questions today. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tyler Brown with Raymond James. Please proceed with your question. Hey. Good morning, guys. Hey, Tom. Good morning. Hey, Jewel, so it sounds like uh, in Q1, weather was fairly normal. Just any thoughts here on Q2 for weather? I know it's been off to maybe a rough start here in Q2. Just anything to think about there? Well, January has been cold, uh, at least the first couple of weeks with the polar vortex. But the reality is, Tyler, you, uh, you know, we have expectations um, in our seasonal business. You know, Q1, we expect October to be great, and it was. We expect December to be wet, and it was, and so it was typical. We expect January uh, to not be great weather. That's, that's when we're fixing our equipment, as I said, and so we're just getting ready for the work season. So we were able to work uh, in, where we could in January, and um, but it, it definitely was uh, pretty cold in a lot of places. 
Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. And then, Greg, I just, just so I have it for modeling, but at the midpoint of the revenue guide, I think it's calling for something like a mid-teens revenue growth. But just can you remind us how much of that is from expected M&A? Yeah, you're right. It's fifteen um, percent was the was the projected um, midpoint from last year, and uh, it's going to be typical to what it was in, you know in the first quarter, um, about half and half, um, you know, equal percentage organic and inorganic, and that's you know probably in the range of you know one hundred and twenty five, one hundred and thirty million dollars of acquisitive revenue. Perfect. Okay, that's super helpful. And then, Jewel, so I, I know that M&A has been a driver since we're talking about it, but you, you seem to have had a lot of success with Greenfields, and I'm just curious if that will become a bigger part of, call it, the external growth story in coming years. And if we just take Waycross as an example, how does establishing a Greenfield hot mix plant in a new market drive discussions around additional M&A? Right. Uh, Tyler, good question. Greenfields have always been, a, you know, one of our three um, growth strategies where we see an opportunity to go to an adjacent market. And Waycross was just a perfect example of, you know, seeing an opportunity in an adjacent market for the Scruggs company to go put a hot mix asphalt plant. And that really led to the discussion uh, with the Littlefield company um, about acquiring their business and 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 bringing their workers and their equipment into that area, that Waycross area. So, you know, once we establish a green field um, and we're in an area, that does provide opportunities for us to con- to try to build market share in that market. And, and you're right, Waycross was a perfect example of that. So, you know, green fields um, are sometimes the answer, uh, sometimes an acquisition to move into an area is the answer, and, but we, we, we're studying all of them. Yeah, no, perfect. That's that's very helpful. Just real quickly, Jewel, kind of conceptually, backlogs are, are strong. It feels like work is picking up on the public side. You look at a lot of private companies. I'm assuming that they are effectively full as well. So I'm just curious if your internal metrics, however you, you measure them, are, are you seeing fewer bidders or more rational bidding for public work given that, let's say, the market is just generally full? Well, I would say, Tyler, um, to, yes, to a certain degree, people are, have good backlogs, and the construction industry has a lot of work. Uh, it's still a competitive bidding environment, but I, I would say, yes, there's probably, due to everyone having a lot of work, there's probably uh, fewer bidders, and I think that's a, the sign of a healthy market. Yeah, okay, perfect. My last one here, Greg, just kind of coming back to the model. I know that there was a gain on the Blue Water Facility Exchange last Q1, but just any broad thoughts just from a modeling perspective, how we should think about gains on sale per quarter? Is it maybe a million bucks or something like that? Just any help would be there. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's that's um, that's right um, from a modeling standpoint. That, that was a, a certainly a one-off. I think every year um, gain on sale equipment is is part of our strategy related to um, uh, you know owning you know operating and then uh, acquiring replacements. So yeah, that's I would say that's a pretty good number. Okay, very good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Hey, Tyler. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Andy Whitman with Baird. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, I guess I was going to start out just by uh, digging into the uh, the margins in the quarter a little bit. And maybe I'll start with the G&A margins here. Um, the raw number was up a, a decent amount, about $3 million or so, uh, above kind of where the run rate's been the last few quarters. And so, Greg, I was wondering if you could just comment on that. Is, is there anything uh, in that number – uh, that makes it uh, unusually high or low. You, know, you, you kind of did some more acquisitions, so I, I thought maybe there's some deal costs in there or something else. But you, you tell us, um, is, is this the new run rate, or is there something different than that we should expect? 
Uh, you know, I think this is about what we would expect. Um, uh, we, you know, if you compare to last year, um, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, there was still some, you know, $50 million worth of low gross margin work that we had to complete. Um, and, and, you know, so we're not, you know, now that we're into, you know, fiscal 24, we're not seeing those anymore. But in terms of overhead and acquisitions, um, you know, we're, we were slightly up this year, this quarter compared to last year. Um, but I think what you're seeing there is you know, individual expenses that maybe we're out of period, but we're still expecting uh, the year to turn out to be what we expected. Got it. Can you just rem remind us what it was that you expected for the year? And GNA? Yeah. Um, 8%. Okay, and then just on gross margins, um, yeah, obviously you, you're starting to get some of the recovery um, with your with your backlog now being better priced and inflation um, coming down. Jewel, um, can can you maybe talk about how how this quarter um, reflects? Is are we now at the run rate where you kind of feel like the 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 price cost dynamics are kind of fully behind you and you're operating at the, the gross margins that that you expect and and maybe if you could uh, just expand on that also by talking about how um, the expectations of the gross margins in the backlog that you've recently won compared to what you've been putting up here this quarter in the last few quarters. Yeah, Andy, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, just as we said, you know, in the summer, you know, we're, we're, it's just really back to normal for CPI. And I think that's what you saw this quarter. Um, if you remember last year in the first quarter, we said, hey, we're finishing up a lot of this pre-inflationary backlog because a lot of the projects we do finish in the October, November, December timeframe. They, they get final paving. And so, you know, last year's first quarter, we were just finishing a lot of that work. And so what you're seeing this quarter is really just us back to normal, um, doing work that has... Uh, you know, the cost baked in. And so it's very much just a normal business. And I would say we're adding backlog uh, to, we're adding work to backlog at healthy margins. Uh, we're seeing that our uh, crews and our teams in all the areas are going out there and finding ways to win on projects, which is very much back to the norm uh, of CPI where more projects finish at better than bid margin. And so to us, it's really just getting back to the normal operating model of CPI. Got it. Okay, um, just one last final question, probably for Greg, I'm guessing. Um, I was just kind of curious, that when you think about um, revenues of HMA or aggregates to third parties, uh, this first quarter uh, in 24 versus the first quarter in 23. Greg, can you talk about um, um, how, how that changed and, and the impact that that had on margins, maybe like total total dollars sold to third parties, just to, so we can understand how much of a component of your revenue mix that part of your business was? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I guess, first of all, let me say that, you know, that, uh, that particular area of sales revenue for us is focused um, more in the commercial private market. So, um, you know, I, I feel like internally we noticed that that was still a very strong component of our of our business. So it was really good to see. I think just another internal indicator for us uh, that, uh, you know, that, that activity is still strong. Um, we are typically in the 10 to 12 percent, um, I think we've talked about before, of third-party sales of both aggregate and hot mix asphalt uh, each year in our, in our revenue. And there wasn't a change this year versus last year, still kind no. of consistently in that range? Still, still pretty consistent, yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Senegar with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Hey, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Just 
Uh, I think you might have touched on it a little bit. Maybe it was with weather in January. Just curious, with such a strong start to the year, um, any reason to not raise the full year outlook? Was there anything that kind of stuck out to you? Is there anything we should be aware of that you're implying maybe just with 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 margins maybe in the last the next nine months that 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 changed your expectations from from coming into the into the year no michael uh not at all i'm glad you asked that question um we typically look at our business as two halves of the year and so you know that's why we talk about our revenue is 40 60 and our EBITDA is typically 30 70. you know we just we really try to just get through the first two quarters and then assess our business at mid-year. Uh, and so, you know, we, we feel good about our guidance. There's no, there's nothing we're doing other than just saying um, we're reaffirming that. We'll take a good hard look at it after the second quarter, you know, at our mid-year. Great. And just with, with the quarter, um, anything you could touch on with the margin on, on, we obviously saw, you know, there's lower diesel, maybe liquid asphalt, just, was, was that a benefit to the margin Q1? And how are you thinking with where that those prices are today, um, what it means kind of for, for the next three quarters, if it stays at this level? Yeah, Michael, um, you know, I think what uh, we always say is that, you know, when there is some um, downward pricing and energy costs, we do get a little tailwind, and when it goes up, we, we see a little little headwind. And I, I don't think that has changed. Um, I think if you look back over the last 12 to 18 months, um, primarily diesel and natural gas have fluctuated w- within a pretty tight range. It was, seems like it was more back in you know, early 2022 when it when it kind of spiked up. So mm. I, I think we're operating within a pretty decently stable range, and and uh, you know certainly taking those slight tailwinds when when we can get them. Great. And just I'll, my last one. Obviously, we're we're going into an election year. I'm curious if you hear on the ground of uh, does that create any uncertainty you think with your business, or is this less of a concern maybe compared to prior election years because you do have that legislation that you know the IAJ that was passed? Just curious, kind of how we think about that in election year with some of the funding, um, and and if it's a little different this this go around than maybe what you have seen in other prior election years. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, hey, Michael. Um... Good question. Uh, you know, the the good thing for us is in Washington, D.C., certainly has a lot of things they argue about, but infrastructure funding is probably the most bipartisan thing in Washington. And so uh, both parties see the need to invest in the nation's infrastructure. They always have. And so um, we really don't see the election uh however it turns out really affecting the funding um for the IJA or the um the surface transportation funding overall so uh clearly we want the economy to remain strong and stable and uh but we really uh don't think the election is going to have a big impact on our business thanks everyone Our next question comes from the line of Stanley Elliott with Stiefel. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, morning, could Stanley. you guys talk about like when you all would expect your backlogs to normalize? I mean, it looks like you've got cover for the rest of the year. Um, curious if we should see some improvement on on the organic side. You, how can you flex the labor component to maybe to add above the seven plus percent sort of numbers you guys are looking at on the organic side? Stanley, I'll, uh, I'll address the backlog first, and then organic growth. Um, the our backlog, you know, was an, set another record this quarter, and so I think that's 13 quarters in a row, which is very atypical uh, for CPI. Uh, in that our backlog uh, sequentially uh, t- has always tended in the busy season to go down when we're burning off a lot of backlog. And so that indicates two things. Number one, we're growing. And number two, uh, it's an active uh, bid environment. 
Uh, but at some point, we can only sell but so much ahead of our resources. And so at some point, it's not going to surprise us at all for it to our backlog to go down sequentially. Um, so, but it does give us good visibility. It does allow us to stay patient at the bid table, uh, which, are, which are great things. Uh, on the organic growth side, uh, we continue to focus heavily on organic growth. Um, and uh, you're right, to do that, we have to add labor. And so we continue to add labor and equipment and to invest in organic growth. Uh, as Greg said, you know, beyond maintenance capex, we add equipment, we hire people, and you know, try to invest in high value growth initiatives on the organic side. Um, that's great. And in, in terms of kind of the, the backlog or the, the pipeline of work, any any kind of drill down co uh, co color you guys could share on maybe some of the states that you guys are seeing the most activity? Uh, just curious to try to get a little uh, sense within the portfolio there. Well, I would say all six states, we have active bid environments. So there's no state that I would say is any concern. Clearly, when you look at our states, uh, Florida and Tennessee and South Carolina are just have great funding programs and are very, very active. Uh, Florida is clearly uh, experiencing just an incredible amount of migration, but so is Tennessee and South Carolina. North Carolina has a very healthy funding mechanism. So it's Georgia's great. I mean, it's uh, there's all of our platform companies are adding work to backlog um, and and bidding a lot of work. So we're blessed in that regard. Perfect, guys. I'll turn it over. Thanks so much, and best of luck. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Our next question comes from the line of Adam Thalamer with Thompson Davis. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, guys. Great quarter. Hey, Adam. Hey, good morning. i got to be honest. Stanley stole all my questions. <laughs> but maybe I'll just double um, up. I, I was curious on um, kind of your expectations for DOT bidding in the next few months. Well, we've got uh, quite a bit to bid on. You know, the DOT as you know, doesn't bid, um, uh, you know, evenly throughout the year. A lot of their work does bid in the next few months uh, in some of our states. And so uh, we've got a pretty big uh, letting in North Carolina uh, this month and uh, South Carolina here next week. So um, they're, 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 you know, the winter time, they let a lot of work that they want to do in the spring and summer. And so it's it's pretty active. And then, Jewel, are, uh, are, there, are any of the ankle weights still hanging around? I was curious if labor is getting a little bit better. I would say it's pretty much normal now, uh, Adam. I mean, clearly the generational, uh, as I've talked about, the generational just uh, retiring of our workforce makes it harder to find skilled operators, but I think that's an advantage for us because we're going to do what it takes to attract and retain a workforce. And so we see that as a, an advantage that we're going to try to leverage. Uh, but as far as just finding labor to fill our crews, um, uh, the annual raises, uh, you know, the cost of labor, it just, it's back to normal. It's a pass-through cost that is not out of control like it was right after COVID and the reopening of the economy. So I, I would definitely say I don't feel like we're running with any ankle weights now. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right, Em, thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Brent Thielman with DA Davidson. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, lot covered here. Uh, I guess just just a couple here, Jewel. Morning. Um, is the Jewel is the fact that your markets are so good impacting your ability to do deals as fast as, as you'd like? Uh, you know, your results are solid. I assume many of the potential targets are too. Just wondering if that's having an impact on seller expectations or or, or seller expectations reasonable. 
Yeah, Brent, uh, that's a good question and one that we get asked a lot. And the reality is the markets and, and them being solid really don't play into our sellers' um, thoughts because our sellers are thinking more long-term with what's best for their family. And they're, they're doing family, um, you know, generational planning and, and what, you know, they've, they've made a lot of money in this business for, for decades. And so they're really not looking at the short term market. And, uh, so I really haven't seen any change in their expectations. I really haven't seen any, um, thing about the current, you know, funding, making them, uh, less willing to sell. We're we're in a lot of conversations throughout the Southeast and the Sun Belt with potential sellers. That's, um, you know, our pipeline is active. So, but the markets being healthy really isn't a big consideration for them. It's more what's best, you know, just for the overall uh, business and their families long term. Okay, that's great, Jewel. And then, um, Greg, this one might be for you. I apologize if you mentioned this at the in the script, yep. but the um, the first quarter cash flow was unseasonably good, really good. Yep. And just curious, you know, do we see that? Do, do we see the typical pattern through the rest of the year, or is this going to be less than a typical year for cash flow? Yeah, no, I think that uh, you know, yeah, it was a good, it was a good first quarter. I, you know, first of all, margins helped right year over year. Um, certainly have more to more, and then revenue going up quarter over quarter. Both created great cash flow opportunities just to turn that revenue in, into cash. Uh, I think in terms of the rest of the year, we're we're going to see um, more a traditional, um, you know, going back to what we've experienced from a cash flow perspective. Over the years, obviously, the last couple of years um, were, were strange and different, but I'm expecting to go back uh, to more normal cash flow for uh, 2024. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Brett. Our next question comes from Brian Russo with Sedoti. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Brian. It just morning just just to, to follow up on uh the dot you know letting activity i mean how would you compare it you know to last year uh is it you know uh, is it accelerating you know for the for, you know because the dot's are you know anxious to get the iij uh matching funds you know or is it just more you know turnkey based on their their state programs just curious yeah brian i think both of those are right i think that the IJA uh, funds come through the normal uh, programs that the federal government uh, gives the money to the states in the federal fiscal year, and so the states have to spend that money or commit it. And so uh, I think it's very similar to last year in, the, in the, what the states are doing. Uh, but I also think the states uh, are – they have their own funds, as we talked about Previously, Florida, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, and now Georgia um, recently announced they're they're using um, state funds to augment infrastructure funding uh, because they they need to keep up with the migration to their states, and so um, we really see that the DOT's activity, um, if anything, it's it's uh, more than last year, uh, but certainly very similar. And so uh, it's it's an active bidding environment, and uh, and I think that we, you know, the IJA, we still are just really uh, are in the early innings, maybe the third or fourth inning of that this money getting uh, to the to the projects and being spent. And so we still got a lot long way to go with that. Okay, great. And then just uh, on the backlog, obviously, you know, another strong quarter despite uh, seasonality uh, of the business. I mean, how would you characterize, you know, the the, the projects on, on the public side and then maybe the, the private side? I mean, uh, you know, is it still, 
you know, similar size and, and, and duration uh, on the uh, public side. And then as there is a heavier concentration, um, you know, in manufacturing or an in industrial on, uh, on the commercial side. Yeah, Brian, I think, uh, you know, an analysis of our backlog obviously is, you know, dictates kind of what we say we're going to do in terms of the mix of revenue going forward. I think Jules said a minute ago, at 63.37 is kind of what we expect, public to private. Um, and, and that's pretty normal. It was what it was last year. Um, so I think the makeup is very similar. Um, and then in terms of duration of project, size of project um, is also very similar. We um, we track that and want to understand that because as you know, you we've talked before there that there's a sweet spot that we're we're you know achieve, trying to achieve and um, it has not changed. All right, great, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. We have no further questions at this time. I would like to turn the floor back over to management for closing comments. Yes, we'd just like to thank everyone for joining us this morning, and we look forward to speaking with you again next quarter. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation, and have a wonderful day.